all welcome. I hope all of you are doing well in the middle of COVID and are figuring out ways to thrive from home. Um, we have been having a series of lunch and learns and a six pack startup challenge that have really kept us all very busy here with a lot of great engagement. So what we are talking about in the Commercialization Academy is how to take your really good high tech idea and how to figure out how to make a business out of that. And so this talk today is going to be for people that are um, uh, anybody who is interested in commercializing, um, but specifically those people who are trying to figure out how to get a small business off the ground. And if you have been trying to think about whether or not you want to start up, you might be in a better place than to look at this today because um, Understanding cash and cash flow is one of the things that is most critical to the survival of a startup. And you need to understand this basically. You also need to know if you have any interest in it. If you don't, you might choose to stay in your lab and license your technology to somebody else to build a business out of it. But if you love this, it's another great sign that, that creating a startup and creating your own business might be the right way to go. So. Um, Hunter, if you'll throw us forward one slide. Today we're going to talk about cash if king. It is not if, <laughs> cash is king. <laughs> uh, sorry for the typo, but that, that's a great reminder. Cash is really king uh, in a small business. Um, and we're going to talk about why that matters, kind of how to think about that, um, what kind of decisions cash drives, and then also the financials or the frameworks that you use to measure it. So how do you use it? How, what kind of KPIs do you use to measure and manage your cash so that you can make good decisions and hopefully open doors for yourself, give yourself more opportunities? So um, Hunter, if you'll go forward one more, I want to talk real quick um, for folks that have been uh, moving along with us in this, we have a 12-step process that we have been following this year in the Commercialization Academy for 12 steps to start up. So I'm going to walk through this super briefly, but it's um, a reminder that back in January, we talked about flipping the entrepreneurial framework. And that's that fundamental idea that if you've invented a really great idea in your lab, you, um, you still need to go out and find out what industry needs. Because industry needs something different, 99.9% .9 likelihood, than what you invented. So you need to find out the real need and then solve their problem using your technology. So if you can change your mindset toward a customer-focused mindset, you will be setting yourself up for success, um, both, uh, in my opinion, in your startup, but also in your research. So... Um, the second session in February was about customer discovery. How do we go out and talk to industry? That sounds uh, wicked scary, and uh, I like my lab. Thank you very much. So we talked about how to do that, how to meet people, how to get networked, um, and, and um, be able to ask the questions that have them tell you about the problems that they're trying to solve. So number three in March, we talked about what the hell is an IRL. And an IRL is an industry readiness level or an innovation readiness level. Both of those are trying to talk about a framework that we provided on figuring out what are your strengths and weaknesses. And all good ideas need to think through this. What's good about it? What's bad about it? Where do I need help? So we really recommend working with our group at Venture Partners, right-sizing yourself, figuring out what are the resources that you need to push your idea forward. Number four is license or startup. And I touched on that just now. When you want to commercialize an idea, fundamentally, um, you have to choose whether you want to license it out to someone else to do it or to do it yourself. So we talked about the differences. Uh, what are the monetary returns, but also what's the amount of effort that goes into each of those. Number five was explore your ecosystem. So that was fun, doing a map of what is the value chain out in the ecosystem that, that you are affecting. So we figured out what the heck is an ecosystem, how does that relate to your industry, and then how do you figure out who all the players are? 
So this again helps right size. It gives you perspective on where does your product play a role and why is it or isn't it important to people in industry. Okay, we're gonna talk about cash is king today. Um, and we're gonna again talk about just uh, what are these opportunities that understanding cash can provide. I'm gonna turn now to our two speakers for today who I could not be more excited about. So um, Hunter Albright is, um, he's just a rock star in my world. So he, um, he is a uh, faculty over at Leeds in the business school, but really his background is heavy in startups and other companies on the front range. Um, and I love his breadth of experience. He shows up like as a clean tech mentor, but then he also shows up working in a number of small businesses. He started his own um, and he, he has just a great understanding of financials. So when I was looking for a ringer, he was the first guy I reached out to. He's brought in his partner in crime, Amy Marmalejo. She is currently, maybe I'm not sure, is it SVP or what do we call you <laughs> over Star, but yeah, she I am the SVP, but really the uh, global controller. So I'm responsible for all the accounting operations. Good gosh. Okay. So a huge company. She's the global controller. Before that, she was CFO of a, of a company that was a small company for her, but that small company, Tendril, was raised $100 million while she was there. So that is a startup that has done very well in this area. So both of them have this huge deep tech startup experience that they're going to bring to the table today. So from there, I'm just going to turn it over to you two to take it away. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Sally and Colin, for helping get us so organized and ready for today. Uh, Amy and I are super excited to be here. Uh, we started working together when we were at Tendril uh, and sort of as Amy was talking about a little bit earlier, really helped take Tendril from a brand new restructured company, think about the innovation, think about the financing, uh, to position them ultimately for a private equity sale. Uh, we have started to collaborate around finance and really about helping companies think about finance strategically and how to use the numbers to identify opportunities and actually go out and raise money to sort of bring the opportunities to life. Um, so we'll talk through some of our thoughts. It's going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour. Uh, we have our, we'll share the slides. We have our contact information on them um, to give you, you know, feel free to reach out with any questions. Also, just as a reminder, please post any questions in the uh, chat. We'll address as many of those as we can uh, as we go through. Um, as Sally said, I teach at CU. I teach venture planning in the business school. Um, and then I also am a fellow sort of researcher scientist. I have my PhD in systems engineering uh, and teach uh, blockchain in the engineering school, as well as I'm the executive director of the University of Colorado Blockchain Alliance. So really passionate about science and, and how to take science into companies. Uh, I've done eight different startups over my career and started my first company as a PhD student um, as I was sort of going through university uh, and just have not been able to shake the bug since then. Uh, and very fortunate and privileged to work with people like Amy along the way uh, who make it very enjoyable and also help uh, achieve sort of great things. So. I'll, Amy, I'll hand it over to you to introduce yourself and then we'll go from there. Well, hello everyone. Um, like I said, my name is Amy Marmalejo. Um, I have both a big company and a small company background as, as has been mentioned. And um, Sally asked me if you didn't catch it, how did you go from startup to a big company? And really part of my strategy is to play with the really big boys. It's a different, it's a totally different game um, depending on what your revenue is and we're 2 billion in revenue. Um, and so I wanted to come and learn how to do things at a larger level. But really what my, I'm passionate about is the numbers and accounting and finance and demystifying it for people because I think that it's something that is so often forgotten um, or neglected because people don't like it, yet it's something really foundational to what you need to do. Um, but we have good news for you um, later in the presentation that um, idea people aren't always great at finance, but that doesn't mean it should be a barrier to entry. Three. Six eight zero nine three three. Not me, by the way. <laughs> hey, Tata Pierre Lian. Hey, can everybody mute, please? Thanks. 
Okay, so if you know, we really want to be here to mystify it for you. So Hunter and I, um, we are partners in crime. We really enjoy doing this, and I just want to say we're available to help you if we, um, if you have any questions that we can't get through today. So I'll turn well, it over cool. to Hunter to take us through the agenda. So yeah, just to give everybody a preview, we're going to go through some foundational concepts, just things that you need to be familiar with as you're thinking about financing for your business, for your venture. Uh, so that you can be more educated in what the tools are and how you can use the tools. We'll talk through why the numbers matter in terms of the importance of how to structure them, both for managing the, uh, the opportunity as well as sort of using them to sort of help raise capital. Uh, we'll go through a bit about why the numbers are so uh, often neglected uh, and what you can do about that. And then we'll close we're talking about how you can then use your numbers uh, to help build the financing and gain the financing you need for your business. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna hand over to Amy to uh, walk us through the foundational concepts. Wonderful, thank you, Hunter. So as we move on to the first slide, so you've heard Hunter and I describe this as the numbers. Um, and I would describe it as the numbers because the numbers aren't just the balance in your bank account. It's not just the assets that you have or the revenue you've made. It's a combination of things. Um, it's your financial statements. So your balance sheet, your income statement, um, but it's also your forecasting. And lastly, it's your KPIs so your, and your metrics, which are your measurement indicators. And so we bucket that all into one thing and call them the numbers because really, A, they're completely interrelated, um, but B, you need to have your hand um, on the pulse of all of them because, because they are interrelated. And so um, moving to the next slide, um, we also want to talk about what is the difference between accounting and finance. So um, accounting just very simply is focused on the past. So accounting looks backwards to say, how did I do? And what does that mean? And it's really important um, to make sure that you get your historical information correct, because if it's not correct, then when you start looking forward, then you're not going to look forward correctly. And so one of the things that, you know, an example I want to tell you, when I started at Tendril, I was hired as their controller to take them public. And we obviously didn't go public. We restructured the business. It took me a year to clean up the financial statements to provide accurate, actual data, right? So it, because of a lack of focus on it, um, all of the data went like this. It wasn't in the right period. And it took me a year to get that cleaned up in order for us to appropriately um, be able to forecast. So finance, which is the next section, Finance focuses on the future. So that's where your budgeting lives, your forecasts live. Um, that's when you say, I think I'm going to make $100,000 of revenue this year. It's all based on estimation and assumptions of what's going to happen in the future. And you also want to focus on getting the forecast right because it's A, so cash is king, critical to managing cash flows. Um, B, making good decisions, right? Because if you don't have good data, you're not going to make good decisions. Um, but it's also important for establishing trust with vendors, or sorry, trust with investors. So one of the things that you're doing is everyone knows it's going to be hard for you to get to where you're going, but you want to make sure you have that credibility. Next slide. So these right here are your key financial statements. Um, these are your actual financial statements. So this is what is reported when you report on your actual results. This is what your accountants are doing. So you have an income statement, also known as a P&L or profit and loss statement. Cash flows, this is your most important thing and we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like later in the presentation. Your balance sheet is saying basically what assets and liabilities you have. Sometimes people in personal finance call that net worth. So your assets minus your liabilities. And then last is your cap table and equity roll forward. When you start raising capital or getting debt, um, those things need to be paid back. So debt like a loan or equity when you sell your company. So your cap table is really foundational at helping you understand Later down the line, when you sell your business, how does that get distributed? Next slide. 
So we found this fun slide for you guys. So <laughs> um, Hunter lived in the UK for several years. So turnover is the same thing as US revenue. But this was a cute slide to say, you know, revenue is important. Profit, which is what you have, revenue minus expenses, keeps you sane, um, but cash is the most important thing of all. And that, you know, the reason that is, is that um, in order to generate cash, you have to be profitable. And it's hard to get to profitability. Your first goal is to get to revenue. Your second goal is to get to profitability. And what that does is it makes you self-sufficient. So it's hard to bring an idea to market. And so many people lose sight of the fact that that cash number, more than any other metric that you have, is going to be the place that you focus on most. Um, I, we, you know, EchoStar is now a big, big company, and you can move to the second slide, Hunter. That's fine. Um, and we have two billion dollars of cash, um, but it took years. Um, more than a decade and a half to get to something like that, right? I don't worry about that, something, someone else does. But you guys need to worry about that every single minute um, as you guys are bringing something to market. Now this slide that Hunter has ahead of, uh, in front of you right now is the most powerful tool that I created at Tendril. Now, I, I basically simplified it, but what you're looking at is what I, sh um, I went over with the CEO on a weekly basis. This is based on quarters because it's too hard for me to present it to you in weeks, but we had one by week, by month, and by quarter. And what you'll see is this is just a running cash balance with scenario analysis. So as it shows, scenario one obviously is the best option. If everything goes well, we won't run out of money until Q3 of 2021. But then you see in scenario two, and these scenarios could be anything, right? This is just really meant to be, to show you what something like this could look like. Scenario two would be something doesn't go to plan. You're hoping for something, but it doesn't go to plan. And you'll look that you're gonna run out of cash a quarter earlier. Scenario three, something else doesn't work out and that you have planned for and that cash out date goes up another quarter. The reason that that's important and the reason that you need to have a finger on that is because that's typically tied to all your people. It tells you how much money you need to raise and when you need to raise it. And not just when you need to raise it, but when that cash has to be in your bank account. And the last and most important column is, is when is the cash out date if nothing changes from what's happening today? I would tell you that if you get nothing else and you build nothing else from a financial perspective, this is the most important tool that you will ever have for yourself. And we'll talk about how, how these get built and who can help you. But this is just a really good example of what your finance person should be able to do for you. Next slide. So this is one of my favorite slides. So this is, this is you guys, um, or me, or Hunter, right? And there's sharks in the water. And the reason that is, is each of us have a different risk tolerance. And knowing your risk tolerance is one of the most important parts of this process. Um, Sally kind of mentioned it, you know, she's like, if you don't like to do all these things on the journey, maybe you want to stay in the lab. Um, but even if you come out of the lab and you want to try it, there's those of us that have a high risk tolerance. So I have a higher risk tolerance. Um, Hunter has a less risk tolerance than me. Um, that's going to be important in knowing how comfortable you get on the previous slide. So Hunter, move up. Can you go back one? So if you have a high risk tolerance, <laughs> you are probably going to push the distance between when you start raising capital to raising capital. If you have a lower risk tolerance, you're going to be a lot more conservative. You're going to you're going to want to make sure that you wait to add headcount until you have revenue. Um, there are some people, the CEO and I at Tendril have a fairly high risk tolerance, um, and so we learned that about each other, and it changed our decision making. So another thing just to think about, and we have a whole another presentation on that for another thing is how to identify your risk tolerance. Um, but that's going to be an important part of this process for you. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Amy. And so now what we want to dive into a little bit is some frameworks and some structure to think about. One, why the numbers matter 
and how you can use them. I've always thought about the numbers and working with people like Amy and other sort of financial experts throughout out my career is that the numbers really have been the opportunity to, or have been used to strategically to identify opportunities. And I've always thought about a little bit in sort of a sadistic uh, fashion, you know, that sort of audits and accounting really help enumerate and illuminate how you can sort of make your businesses better. And so that's, when we think about numbers and talk about numbers, it's really about how can you almost think of them like that they're your test results out of a lab or the things that you discover in researching is how can they help you guide your way? So everybody's numbers are gonna be unique um, and they're gonna be unique about your opportunity and how you think about structuring it, but they should really be giving you lots of feedback about what's working, what's not working. And if you're just starting out, there really are your hypotheses about what you're going out to prove and then giving you a bit of a benchmark to sort of be able to explain what worked or what didn't and what, what was the reasons behind the gaps. And so you can start with sales. That's going to drive your cost of sales. That's going to drive then your headcount. So what are the resources that you need to bring your business to life and to complete all of the activities and plans that you've put into place? What's the equipment you need? And then what, or if it's a sort of product-based company, what's gonna be the inventory and even the R&D that's gonna be necessor necessary to build that in advance of the sales? Um, and as you were working through that, this is an example of an income statement that Amy and I had presented while we were at, at Tendril. And the key thing we wanted to sort of highlight here, one is, you start with the actuals and then the 2017 is sort of midway through. And so that's a combination of both our forecasts as well as sort of the actuals um, year to date at that point. And then we're forecasting out the 2018 plan. So as Amy sort of presented, we're leveraging the historical analysis to build a really sound foundation about what we can do, how we do it, um, but then starting to leverage the assumptions on the left as the way we are beginning to start to tell stories to investors, to customers, to employees about how are we gonna achieve these great things that we're thinking about. Um, and one of the key things is while we had, and Amy had built a fantastic team at Tendril to generate the reports and make a lot of the decision-making easier and sort of data-driven, uh, you can start out with something as simple as the the seven lines that are highlighted in the red boxes, right? I mean, oftentimes we'll help companies really get started with a five line, six line PNL uh, to get the basics down and just to help start to think about what's important with your business, where are the trade-offs and actually where are the gaps in your knowledge. Um, let me pause there, Amy, anything you wanna add on sort of just the projections and the income statement? No, I would just say is that it's about being simple first, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. This is a really, I think, a pretty version, but we just wanted to highlight for you where you will actually get as your companies um, learn and grow, but focus on a few line items first, um, and then it expands from there. And one of the things you'll hear us some come back to, and I think it's important for uh, I would encourage you not to get caught up in the accuracy and the details of your numbers, because first of all, your numbers are going to be wrong. Um, no matter where you are in your career, whether you're starting out, the numbers, especially looking forward, are always going to be wrong, right? And you want to sort of start to narrow sort of the error rate and sort of how wrong they are. But the main thing for me, and then I try to do and sort of help people with and talk about, is to use your numbers as mile markers to help you tell your story. So whether you're out selling your business, raising capital, it's gonna be about sort of the things that are between the numbers, about what actions you're gonna take uh, and how you're gonna get there, how you're gonna create confidence, and then leveraging the numbers to sort of measure your progress, what's working, what's not working. Um, and one of the great places to start if the financial statements are sort of daunting or you don't know how to pull it all together is, just take a step back and think about unit economics because any financial statement you do or financial model you build will be based off the assumptions that resolve, revolve around your unit economics. And oftentimes the investors will really sort of challenge you and poke at your understanding and your ability to communicate sort of with clarity 
what your assumptions are, or what the realities are. And so we tend to think about it one at a per, tra uh, per transaction level. So really anytime you sell something, what's the revenue you're getting from it and what are the costs? And at that really basic level, then you can start to think about how that might scale up. And then the next level is thinking about that at a per customer level. And generally, I think you can think about it on an annual basis. So think about sort of the annual contract value or if it's a consumer basis, how much, or how much, how many items, how many sort of transactions will an individual consumer have over a year? Um, then think about sort of what the lifetime value of that customer, whether you expect to have them for six months or two and a half years or 10 years uh, in terms of your line of business and, and the opportunity you have in front of you. And then the last one is the customer acquisition costs. So what are you gonna have to invest to acquire that customer? Um, and if you can start to pull together really good assumptions and data around these different elements, building out a financial model and building a financial story that will enable you to uh, keep investors informed, uh, identify where you're making progress in your business as well as raising money uh, will be greatly enhanced. And so one of the things that I wanted to share, this is a business that we've been advising called Briefly, uh, that has went through Boomtown and has sort of gone on to sort of great success is really to highlight how simple the numbers can be as you're telling your financial story. So Marcus, who's the CEO, built this presentation really to sort of highlight one, the opportunity, the, the yellow is really focusing on who their serviceable markets are, right? So they're narrowing in, they have a really specific audience that they're looking at targeting. They've really clearly highlighted how much they're going to charge on sort of a monthly subscription so you can start to see what the annual value is. And then that both starts to give indication on what the overall opportunity can be, but also starts to communicate and sort of enable a dialogue about how much money they should be willing to spend um, to acquire that customer. When I was, I used to run the credit card and loan portfolio of Barclays Bank in the UK. Uh, and we were always targeting that we wanted to sort of have our payback period sort of be five or six months based on what we would spend to acquire a customer. And we would typically spend sort of about 300 pounds to acquire a new customer. Uh, and so, but we knew we would get that paid back from sort of a lending perspective uh, in five or six months. And so we always had these hurdles that we would think about in terms of when we were building new financial products about what it would take uh, to get paid back in, in sort of the time horizon that we were looking at. And then when you start to communicate your trajectory, right, everybody wants to grow a business. Um, I think the numbers that you state are important, but they're directional. The key thing I would encourage everybody to think about how you explain are the gaps in between. So one of the things that briefly did is that when they started, to, where they were presenting this for investors, they would highlight where they wanted to end the year, but the more important item I believe was the clarity in which they talked about the markets that they were in, the markets that they were expanding into, and the products that they were launching every year to then sort of grow the business. Um, and so again, you're using the numbers really as mile markers to help you tell the story about why you're excited about your business, how you're gonna grow it, um, and the help that you're gonna need along the way. Um, and being able to do that and deliver on your story does, two, does one really major thing. It allows you to sort of build trust. And that's building trust with your employees, it's building trust with your investors, and sort of all the stakeholders that you're gonna look at what I around on. sort of um, your business as you start to grow it. Uh, and there is nothing more sort of damaging to your credibility and the team's credibility when you start to, one, um, not have, not be fostering and developing that level of trust. It's not because of not hitting a number, because that's going to happen, but not being able to explain why you hit it and figure out how you can make corrections along the way. And Hunter, I'm going to just add to that a little bit. <laughs> To go back to that risk tolerance concept and it was important that you mentioned building trust with your employees um, you're at you know if you get to the point where you're building a team and your team is small and you're not profitable so you're out raising capital or debt 
you know, their lives are in your hands too, right? So their paycheck is in your hands. Sally asked me before, like, what is the difference in my stress now at a big company versus a small company. And I was always worried about my employees and their mortgages and their families. Um, you're bringing people along for a risk, you know, a risky venture. Um, just make sure that you can build that trust. Um, and that lack of accuracy does destroy credibility. The last debt round that I did at Tendril, I did it, they did it, they invested in me, not any, yes, the company, but they invested in me as well. And what I was saying and what I would deliver, um, your credibility is going to become really, really important. All right, so with that, so why are the numbers so often neglected? Um, it's very, very simple. Um, the numbers are neglected because it is not typically an entrepreneur's strength. Um, many entrepreneurs, because you're idea-driven, creative people, um, have either zero finance training and education because it's never something that you wanted to do, um, but it's just usually typically not a strength. Now, there are um, entrepreneurial efforts in the finance space, but it's just not what you see mostly. And so because um, they're not a strength, they're perceived to be of little of, or no importance um, to the rest of the business. So we don't like to do what we don't understand how to do. If you think about your to-do list, the things that always fall to the bottom are the ones that are typically the hardest, <laughs> the ones that you don't want to do. And unfortunately, finance and numbers fall into that category for most entrepreneurs. Um, next slide. But there's a silver lining. <laughs> um, I don't want to be all doom and gloom, right? There, the silver lining is there's people like me. Um, and, and people out there to help you. So I am not an ideas person. I am an executor with an exclamation mark. Um, I love this stuff. I love the numbers. And you're going to, you can find other people to help you with this. Just like you would never want me in your lab, I would be worse than an intern. Um, I would know nothing. Um, you can bring me on board or someone like me onto the team to really help you really understand this. And so what we really encourage you guys to do, and we, we do this every time we teach a class like this, what I want you to take away from this is, oh, I'm curious about this and I know I can get help. Um, because if you wanna bring an idea to life, you're never gonna be able to do all the areas excellently. It's about learning what you're excellent at and then finding experts to help you. Next slide. So like I said, get help from those people, learn from them, be curious, and make the numbers a top priority of your business. If you do this, then it will really help make sure um, that you have um, all of the building blocks for success and not leaving one for chance. Um, hey, one of Sorry, we had a question in the chat. Uh, how early in a startup should someone you know, start looking for someone like you? Um, so it, it just, so early. So there, I think the next slide, Hunter. Okay, so these are the three key people that you guys are going to need. Um, and you're going to need them at different times. The first person um, is really a really good accountant. And that's different than a bookkeeper necessarily. There's been a lot of clients I've helped that had a bookkeeper where they're really not focused on accuracy of the numbers for decision making. Um, but a really good accountant is going to help you get the actuals right. And a really good accountant is going to help you on your first sets of preliminary um, preliminary forecasts. So I would, you could get help from someone like that very early in your startup. Um, at the point where you want to put robustness around your numbers, and Hunter, please chime in, um, the, be the better you have when you're actually starting to operate, the better it will be. Yeah, and I'm going to jump in here and pick up, Sally had posted a question about sort of how can you be accurate but not worry about the numbers. And I think the the a little bit, I think, as you start to raise money, as you start to think about maturing the business, the financial analyst and then sort of a CFO is important because they allow you to start to do the projections, even though they're likely not to be correct. Um, you're still trying to minimize the error, but more importantly, you're trying to reduce the uncertainty, right? Investors are happy to take on risk. That's what their job is, is to sort of place bets, figure out where they want to take on risk, but they don't like uncertainty. And so if you can start to think about your forward-looking financial statements of being a, a way to um, sort of project the growth 
and you're making your assumptions and you're building that story to sort of indicate where there's risk, um, but take away uncertainty and that you continually get better over time. And it's, I've always found it's just fantastic to have somebody that will help ask the probing questions uh, about the assumptions, about the, you know, are the growth rates realistic or do the resources, the headcount that you're projecting, are you going to be able to do the job that you need? And to address that, you know, how early, it might not be a full-time equivalent at the beginning. It might be something that's completely outs outsourced, um, but it is something that, that I recommend. I have done now four major cleanups. I am actually in the middle of a major cleanup where I am now. So this is not a pro it's not just a problem with small companies, big companies as well. Um, and so what I would tell you is cleanup efforts are long and they impact every area of the business. So at the point that you're starting to have some scale where you, you wanna know you're tracking cash in, cash out, that's the point where you're gonna start to need help, particularly if you don't enjoy it. Amy, there's a question that's come in about the question around getting help. Um, your thoughts on, or thoughts on budgeting, how much people should budget for that um, at different stages or even early on in a startup. So um, an average accounting manager is going to be between eighty and one hundred and twenty thousand um, dollars, but you're not going to need full time service at the beginning. So what I would be looking at is that you're going to spend probably somewhere between twenty and fifty thousand dollars on accounting and tax services at the beginning. Um, it's usually a quarter FTE to a half time FTE as your business starts to scale. Um, but at the point you have uh, meaningful revenue or meaningful costs, someone's got to do your payroll, someone has to pay your AP, um, it grows to a full-time equivalent pretty quickly. And just to add on to that, I mean, I think as, you, as everybody's starting out, I know when, when I've done a number of businesses, we've always just gone out and found sort of a, a recommended financial accounting manager or a sort of finance person to help out on an hourly basis. And even somebody coaching you and giving you sort of guidance about things that you can do yourself um, helps keep the cost down as you build up to investing in more help at the appropriate steps along the way. Okay, so the last section that we want to transition into is really now leveraging your, your numbers to think about how you finance your business, right? All of these things that uh, the visions and what we want to do are going to take capital and they're going to take different decisions to get you there. Um, so when you think about it, what you have now and what you are selling, and that's your vision of the business, the story that you're going to tell about your growth and the assets that you currently have determines the type of capital you should be looking to go get um, and obtain. And it's not the other way around, right? So um, one of the elements of this is also the type of business that you want to have, right? Do you want it to be a venture backed company? And, ha and do you want to be giving up that ownership? Do you want to have sort of the, the accountability to a board and to investors, or do you want to bootstrap it? Um, or to what Sally was talking about earlier, would you rather just license the technology and continue on sort of thinking about the next great thing and then have, have a partner that's going to help sort of commercialize and bring sort of the, the, your product vision based on the technology to life. So again, this is all about a story. When you're raising capital, uh, you were selling a story. As Amy mentioned, you're selling a story about the team. You're selling about sort of um, the story of sort of the opportunity that's in the market. And you're selling a story about how you're going to get it done. Uh, and I can't sort of stress enough that there's, this is an art about the more comfortable you get about sort of saying how you're going to go from A to B. Uh, and what that's going to look like and starting to build sort of traction and results that you're able to deliver on your word. You're able to sort of identify the, the challenging problems and start to figure out how to address them. You're going to get more and more people that are interested in your company. As you move through the way, I, I sort of, I'm saying here that, right, emphasize story over the detail. Not that the detail won't be important, but be selective about really where you want to go deeper and have that be an enhancement to your story and the confidence that you can build around, around your venture. 
So there's four main areas that I wanted to bring up in thinking about financing, right? So from a, I'm gonna start with the grants. Uh, coming out of academia or coming out of research, grants can be a great opportunity. They're non-dilutive. Uh, you can get cash in and can really help you bridge some gaps and continue to develop some technologies. The STTR and the SBIR grants out of the government um, can be fantastic to help build businesses. They can be multi-stage and they're oriented around commercializing companies, but the timing can be challenging. The application process takes a lot of effort and you don't necessarily always get the money when you need it. Um, then when you think about equity in terms of getting either sort of seed level, series A, series B type investment in the business, uh, it, it's expensive, right? You're giving up a lot of your company to get, get sort of that capital in. Um, and so you have to really question whether you want to do that, whether you want to give up sort of the ownership and the control um, that, comes, that comes with it. But on the positive side, you know, they're taking the risk alongside with you. So there's no expectation around payback um, other than really sort of you want to be telling the story about how you're going to get them a return in the process so as long as as well as with yourself. Um, debt can be a cheaper opportunity or a cheaper alternative to equity. Um, but it also is typically reserved for more mature companies where there are assets that would securitize it. Um, and also you have to pay it back. So you have to think about what the financing and how that would integrate into your cash flows. But above all of these, right, revenue is the best way to do it, right? Really thinking about how you could bootstrap your company, thinking about how you can leverage revenue uh, to think about growing and being able to invest it. I mean, things like Kickstarter, especially for smaller companies, companies that are doing product-based things. When you think about Kickstarter, it is basically a pre-sale of your business, of the product, of the service that allows you to get actually cash from your customers to finance your business. And that opportunity is different um, in different contexts, but it's always one worth thinking about, about how do you go to your customers and how do you get revenue as the way to drive your business? Um, we even did it at Tendril. We would go out and talk to strategic customers and think about how we could partner with them and basically leverage their cash reserves with, for a prepayment on, it might be a custom service, it might be a longer term product that they, would want, they wanted us to do. Um, and we would strategically ne negotiate how we could bring that revenue forward to give them an advantage in the market, but also help ease some of our financing sort of goals or cash flows in order to help bring those opportunities to life. Amy, do you want to share anything that comes to mind um, uh, based on the fundraising? Only thing that I would say is take that back to that cash for cash slide, right? So where those there was negatives, right? That was an example of a company that was not yet to profitability. So what that means is their revenue was not enough to, to cover all of their ex the forecasted expenses. And so in that case, you know, the demand it puts on raising capital, whether it be debt or equity, um, and what you need to pay for it is, um, is hard. And um, I don't think that there's a single person that's raised any capital that would tell you it was fun. Um, there are a couple of bluebirds that they go to their first VC and they get their first five million dollars but for the lion's share of people it is a arduous arduous process and um and so if you can do it on revenue if you can do it on bootstrapping it is so much easier for you um some people don't have the option right but if you can do it it's it's something that i think really should be focused on yeah, just and uh, Amy, I want to pick up on a question that's come in from Ted as well in terms of asking why is revenue best? And then, and Ted, I think that's a great question because it, it may not be the best. I do want to take it back to what Amy was talking about in terms of risk profile. I think, you know, there is no one answer in all of this sort of startup, you know, company growth sort of strategy and environment that we're all talking about. Um, it's really going to come down to personal people to base decisions for you, your founders and the people that are involved. Um, because if you have a shorter time horizon or you have a lower risk tolerance, um, you may not want to try to go the revenue only route, right? So uh, I encourage everybody to really think about what's important to you. Um, what are the goals that you want to achieve with your company? And then think through all four areas 
of sort of financing and sources of capital for your company to try to find the right mix. Yep, and I would I would agree I would agree with that. And to to Sally's concept is revenue is validation, right? So revenue is market validation that um, that it's working. So really, probably this is not a binary equation. It is it is looking at all of the options because you're going to do a mix. All right. By the time we were done at Tendril, we had done the full. We didn't have grants because it wasn't available to us, but we had a a whole host. We had debt, we had equity investment, um, and then we had revenue. So it's a combination. And regardless of what your source of funds are going to be, um, one every everybody should be starting to think about what your story will be to gain the confidence for somebody to provide capital to into your business but also being able to answer these questions, right? What is the amount of money you, you need? How are you gonna use those funds? What's the runway it's gonna give you, i.e. how long is it gonna last? Uh, when are you gonna break even? Um, and then ultimately, because investing is not philanthropy, um, what is gonna be the return on that investment? And you know, I think the more you can start to think about and work with your financial help or even through your own modeling, be able to answer these questions it will help drive your ability to raise capital uh, in your business. Amy, you want to sort of uh, sort of close out a few parting thoughts? Yes, absolutely. So, um, like I said, guys, um, you know the story. So, help me out, Hunter, because I can only see closing thoughts. Okay. But, <laughs> um, telling the story really, really, really matters. So, what is the story, and, and where it is that you're going to go? Um, and I'm just gonna hand it to you, Hunter, because I don't want to get it wrong. Yeah, no. So, the second thing is really make the numbers a focus, right? You want to think about when you make a promise, when you make a commitment with your statements. Do what you're gonna say that, you, that you're gonna do. Uh, outline what's going to take to get you to the number and then execute that and then work with your employees and your board members about understanding why it didn't happen and how you can get better. Keep it simple. Uh, financial statements, key performance indicators, what you track doesn't have to be complex. Um, focus on a few things and get better at them and show progress and then add, add the complexity as you go forward. Um, and don't be afraid of being wrong, right? Be directional. Don't worry about not being perfect, but continue to try to make progress and make things better, right? I think Amy had talked about really creating a culture of high performance, creating a culture of driving value, and you want to be able to do that. And the last one is don't be afraid to raise your hand up uh, and ask for help. Uh, it's, first of all, in this community, there's a fantastic sort of wealth of experts to tap into, that are genuinely enthusiastic and want to help, um, but we all need help along the way. Um, and it's you know it's better to get it sooner rather than later because at some point you are going to need need the help from experts. Yes, and uh, don't. And with, and with that, I think we are would love to answer any questions uh, that we can. So um, thank you so much. This is interesting. We've got a great chat going. So if you do have more questions, you can jump in on the chat or uh, jump in elsewhere um, uh, or, or just raise your hand. Um, can you all please address a second the grants? And um, we teach a lot about the grants in the Commercialization Academy because so many researchers do go for grants. But can you give your perspective on them? Sure, I'd be happy to. I mean, I've done, um, I think the two that I've participated in and done the most of is sort of one, the SBIR grants, uh, which companies can apply for directly. Uh, you know, there's, I mean, the university CU's got great resources to help people understand what is available from the Department of Energy, from sort of NSF, from other government um, groups that put those out there, right? I mean, the government is leveraging all of us as their R&D arm with sort of the SBIR and the STTR grants. And so with SBIR, you can apply for them as an individual business. STTRs um, get applied for in conjunction with a qualified research university. Uh, so I think the percentage is up to, or at least 30% of the any funding that comes out of the STTRs goes to needs to go to a university lab, um, but that's another great way to have some of the applied experience from a business 
And if you're thinking about or trying to commercialize something out of the lab, also creates um, unique opportunities to try to develop and, and gain more sort of proof point, uh, proof points of the technology uh, through that process. So yeah, I'll throw out um, Heather and other folks who are interested in specific grants on July 8th is our next Lunch and Learn. And uh, in two weeks, we'll be talking about how to get the Lab Venture Challenge money and how to get the AIA money from the state. Both of those are approximately $125,000 grants um, used for lab and for marketing. So we will follow up in detail on those. We've also um, done a program on SBIRs and we'll be doing more SBIR programming um, throughout the fall. So there's a, a lot on SBIR as well. Um, we had an interesting question about how does uh, getting grant money affect your economic metrics? And so uh, one way that I think of that is, you know, does, does where your income come from affect your metrics or the way that you run your financials and think about your next steps? So, so Sally, I think my, my thought on that, I mean, for me, the grants, and there's a question, another question that come up about is can SBIR grants or those type of grants be damaging to raising um, sort of capital later on? You know, I think grants can be helpful to sort of keep the engine going and doing research and doing sort of customer validation and product sort of market fit work. Um, what they don't replace is having an actual customer that will buy your product, right? That's one of the things that's key to having your valuation of the business go up. Um, so I think it's, you know, there are companies out there that become these S sort of government grant companies where they sort of sustain and it's, it's sort of like a quasi consulting services business in terms of the development um, and the execution of the grants. But if, if you've, I think if you're thinking about a scalable business, grants can be a useful vehicle. Uh, I think especially early on, two things you wanna be, I would say be mindful of. One is that you're not signing anything where sort of core intellectual property that, that venture capitalists or other investors um, might wanna make sure you have control of that has been you know lost during that process. Um, Secondly, is that if you take the money, think about how you can leverage the money or the process or the opportunity that creates to continue to prove out that there are other markets out there that are willing to pay for your products. Because when you think about valuation and showing traction, you're ultimately going to have to show one, you have a sales process where you can take your product or service, market it to somebody and have somebody write you a check. Um, and then two, that you can start to scale both that sales process as well as the manufacturing uh, process for the product. And how I would think about it is it's not really revenue. So it's an inflow into your business. You will report it as revenue because the accounting just makes you do it that way. But debt and equity never show up in revenue. So you should kind of think of your grant revenue as the same thing. If your core business is selling widgets, um, then the, it's the widget revenue that counts. Um, not the grant revenue. It'll just be discounted. And so that's one of, you know, very simply. And what Hunter's trying to say is use it as a stopgap measure, right? Use it as a funding source, but don't really think about it as revenue. And I, I think to jump in, the one final thing I'd add on that is that it's really important that grants are for, for research that you're hoping to get to a product. So it's, it's early money, but you really want to have a plan for how to get to a product that people will buy. So if you're just doing research for research sake, you're going to get caught in a circular pattern. And you're, you're using all of these grants, even if they are for lab work, for figuring out how to get to a product that people need and following your market the whole time. Very well said, Sally. <laughs> <laughs> Been there. <laughs> We've got three voices of experience weighing in. Um, can, uh, do we have any more questions? There have been a lot flowing through. Colin, anything else? Yeah, I'm curious, you know, Amy or Hunter, what are some, you know, maybe red flags or what are some maybe best practices to define someone like you? You know, is there, is there a secret meeting that we could tap into? Or? <laughs> the, yeah, secret account, accountants meeting. Um, you know, 
and Hunter, please, please chime in too. It's about, it's really about networking and asking, asking around about talent. Um, you know, the best accountants um, also are trained to be storytellers. There's a lot of very black and white, boring, you know what I mean, to the letter accountants. That's not really what you're looking for. You're really looking for someone that is a really high achiever that wants to help and learn and grow. And so um, as you network, the first thing to do is ask around people. People know and remember their best finance people. Um, because their fi their best finance people really helped them move the ball um, and and change the game. And so we're out there, um, but it's really about starting networking and asking questions. So other businesses that have been successful, reaching out to people like Hunter and I, um, and then there's a huge recruiting network for accounting and finance people. So the top talent in accounting and finance are all recruited th through external recruiters. So it's also getting plugged into a network like that um but but yes just start reaching out to your network or reach out to someone like hunter and myself awesome well we are at one minute before the hour so i'm gonna wrap it brilliantly on time <laughs> <laughs> oh cool thanks for the results that's really interesting oh yeah look at that sbir line so we know what everybody needs and is interested in. Um, so at any rate, Hunter and Amy, thank you again. This has really been dynamic and interesting and really appreciate your perspective. If uh, again, please reach out to either Hunter or Amy if you have more questions or do reach out to Venture Partners. So we think about this stuff all the time. How do I put together a small company and then how do I get it funded? Um, and how do I keep enough funding to keep everybody employed and keep moving? So um, thanks again. And come join us July 8th. We're going to be talking about the Lab Venture Challenge and the Advanced Industry Grants. Those have a high percentage win rate from CU. So I really encourage you to check that out. And then uh, come to the rest of our programs and come lear learn more about finding your customers and a product market fit. So thanks. Awesome.